sons of tech, arise, behold the banner as it reigns supreme, far from on high the white and gold waves in its triumphant gleam. The spirit of the cheering throng resounds with Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the investiture of the Georgia Institute of Technology's 12th president, Angel Cabrera. Please rise and remain standing for the presentation of colors and the singing of the national anthem.
Please be seated. Welcome again to this investiture. An investiture is a historical moment, and a moment both to reflect on the history and to commit to the future. Presidents may come, presidents may go, but the Institute must endure. My own history with Georgia Tech is short in the grand schemes of things. I am a Charles Isbell. I'm the John P. M. Lay Jr. Dean of the College of Computing and a proud 1990 alum of Georgia Tech. And although my own history is short, it sometimes feels long. I grew up on the south side of Atlanta, just about eight miles due south of here. I had known most of my life that I wanted to come to Georgia Tech, and when I finally got to campus, it wasn't quite eight miles. It felt more like 800. Georgia Tech was so different from the Atlanta where I grew up. A lot of things have changed since my first day on campus some um, 33 years ago. I know I've changed. Georgia Tech taught me to think like a computationalist. It taught me about research. I even learned a little bit of Spanish, some cognitive science, and some history. But the most important thing that I learned from Georgia Tech was how to think about risk. I got to see a college of computing built from scratch. I got to see an entire university transform itself into a world-renowned powerhouse through vision, leadership, and partnership. That transformation came with plenty of thought and caution, but more importantly, it came with boldness and without fear. Today, most importantly, Georgia Tech doesn't seem separate from the city of Atlanta the way it was when I first arrived. We have physically spread into Midtown. In my day, no one ever, ever crossed the connector. But that physical expansion is only a small part of a larger evolution of Georgia Tech. It is now increasingly a part of the city, increasingly a part of the, station, of, the, of the state, and increasingly a part of the nation. At the end of the day, we are an elite university, should make no mistake about that. But we are a public university with a public mission. Our mission is not only to pursue the cutting edge in research, in teaching, and in service, but to make sure that our discoveries make a positive difference for everyone. Our work doesn't just affect those who are lucky enough to come here, like a poor kid who grew up eight miles south of here. What we do here affects everyone in Atlanta, in Georgia, the state, and the world. We have so much that we can accomplish together. We have so much we have to accomplish together. Because the problems we face can only be overcome together. As we welcome our new president, we must realize, as he does, that what comes next belongs to all of us. Because while presidents come and presidents go, it turns out that while they're here, they change everything. They set the direction of the university, they set the character of the university, and I can't wait to see how on hell will help us to make new history. Now I would like to turn the program over to some of the campus stars who are helping us to create that future history. Coming up next will be Pooja 
Yelvin Carr, who's president of the Georgia Tech Undergraduate Student Government Association, Maryam Alavi, who is the dean of the Scheller College of Business, David Brown, chair of the Georgia Tech Staff Council, and Tom Fanning, a two-time Georgia Tech graduate and 2013 honorary PhD recipient. President Cabrera, guests, and the Georgia Tech family. Let's all take a journey back to 1888. We are looking up at Tech Tower. It stands as the tallest building in Atlanta. Who could imagine what would become of the Georgia School of Technology? There were evening classes, only about one major offered, and not quite 500 student organizations. The time is now 2019. We are standing outside by Tech Tower, and we can see the surrounding tall skyline of Atlanta that has been built around us. Over the decades, as the skyline soared, so too did our Georgia Tech. Our population soar, our rankings soar, our line at the Clough Starbucks soar, our new construction loudly soar, and most importantly, our students soar. We soar when we watch our classmates participate in the Mini 500. We soar when we see an engaging TA host exam review sessions with pizza to make sure we all understand the exam material. We soar when we hear the marching band play the Ramblin' Wreck song after a victorious field goal. We soar when students unicycle around campus. We soar when we watch students gather to begin a campus-wide mentorship program, only so that it is in place for when after they graduate. But most importantly, we soar when we are challenged to be better learners, not only in the classroom, but rather in life. Here at Georgia Tech, you just feel that you are part of something bigger and bolder than yourself, that you are not the smartest in the room, because that is not a room a yellow jacket wants to be in. That bold notion of curiosity. It is not just that we pursue our passions here, but it's how we pursue our passions. This is the spirit that enables our institute to soar. And unlike the height of tall towers in Atlanta, or the proud rankings we can now show on one hand, the spirit of a Georgia Tech student is immeasurable. We are in awe of and inspired by the buzz around us. It feels odd to give advice to the Institute President about how to steer the boat that is Georgia Tech. So instead, let's just say, yellow jacket to yellow jacket. President Cabrera, I can imagine there will be things students will get upset about, and we may not always agree. I hope that, just as today, as I was handed a microphone, a microphone has continued to be handed to even more students during this new era. In the excitement to come, remember the everyday students, the ones who dream of someday changing the skyline themselves, but also the ones that may be uncertain, unconnected, and unknowing about what their future holds. That spirit of being a part of something bigger and bolder is such a spirit worth holding on to, and something that makes me feel so, so elated for this time in our Institute's history. So, President Cabrera, drop some pennies on Sideways' grave and bring us what you've got. We are all just as excited as you are. Welcome home and go Jackets. Good morning. I am honored to be here this morning with you today to welcome our new president, Angel Cabrera. I was asked to offer words of wisdom, but you know, it kind of feels strange to offer advice to someone who wrote a book on how to think, how to act, and how to lead in a transformed world. I'm going to try anyway, and understandably, my comments are going to be brief. If you do a search on the terms leader or leaderships on Google, you will have 146 million hits. So I decided to start by introducing uh, the definition of leadership that resonates the most with me. This is a definition given by John Quincy Adams. In his words, 
if your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, do more and become more, then you are a leader. Now, in practical terms, what this means for a dean or a president is that you need to start with very clear values and an inspirational vision and a strategy that engages people. If you do that, then you'll find that they want to do more and become more. President Cabrera, I know that you're all really well on your way to creating an inspirational vision, mission, and strategy for Georgia Tech. You're all in, and we are all in with you. What I would like to do is to add to this definition of uh, John Quincy Adams and argue that in the 21st century, leaders also need to be ambidextrous to be effective. We live in a world that is volatile, complex, and uncertain, with untold challenges and opportunities. Also at Georgia Tech, we have an amazing collectivity of talent, ideas, inventions, and innovations. We have the capacity to address and take on challenges and opportunities as they emerge, and we know that they will. This requires ambidextrous leadership. Just to make sure, by ambidexterity, I don't mean having the ability of using both your right hand and your left hand to doodle during boring meetings. What I mean is to have on the one hand the discipline, efficiency, and focus to execute strategy while remaining agile, innovative, and flexible. Now, what we need to do is that we remain flexible. And uh, the whole idea of uh, flexibility is extremely important. Now, I know that under your flexible and ambidextrous leadership, Georgia Tech will continue its ascend to be a world-class public university and that we will continue to serve Georgia, the nation, and the world through our distinct approach to education, research, and service. On behalf of the faculty, I want to let you know that we are truly excited to have you here. We are here for you and with you, and we are very excited and optimistic with what the future holds. President Cabrera, welcome to Georgia Tech. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> President Ango Cabrera, Dr. Beth Cabrera, and esteemed members of the faculty, staff, and students. On behalf of the staff of this great institution, I am both honored and humbled to stand before you today to officially welcome President and Dr. Cabrera to the Georgia Tech family. President Cabrera, you are charged with leading one of the nation's preeminent technical institutions into a future that demands so much of the next generation of students. Addressing issues such as climate change, conflicts over resources, and the rise of global populism hinges not only on the content of the curriculum here, but on the example you set for us to be responsible, constructive, and engaged global citizens. We are asking a lot of you, but I am proud to say 
that we all believe you are the right people for the job. We look forward to learning from your wisdom, your leadership, and your service. We, the staff, hope for meaningful engagement with you in support of the mission of Georgia Tech. And we hope that you will lean on us to support you as you forge your path to being one of the greatest presidents this institution has ever seen. I want to share something with you, something you said when you addressed the campus. You said, and I quote, you all know what a unique place Georgia Tech is. Our work here is serious, and we take it seriously. But it's not just a job, it's an experience. It's a community. You spend a lot of your time here. Enjoy yourself, have fun, end quote. President Cabrera, we say the same to you. Keep it funny, enjoy yourself, have fun. On behalf of the staff, I hope your presidency is blessed. I wish you and Dr. Cabrera many years of happiness and joy at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Above all, I want you to know that you are welcome. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. What a beautiful day. Members of the Board of Regents of the University System of Georgia, President Cabrera, faculty, staff, and students and guests, thank you for inviting me to speak at today's august occasion. I am so proud of my association with Georgia Tech. I have uh, been instructed to keep my remarks to around three minutes. I take that as a suggestion. Um, and in fact, for me, that may be a bigger challenge than freshman calculus. But in fact, President Cabrera, on behalf of the alumni of this great institution, it is my honor to officially welcome you to the Georgia Institute of Technology. You know, when I received the inv invitation to speak at today's event, I was asked by the organizers to say something that would add to this historic moment. And that's always a tough challenge. But I think if, if I wanted to come up with something, it would be this, that when we frame our day-to-day -day actions, I like to do that in two ways, and I typically categorize that as the what's and the how's. You know, at Southern Company, our what's are essentially making, moving, and selling energy, the most reliable, the lowest prices, with the best customer service in the United States. At Georgia Tech, I think the what is being the top definitive technological research university. The teaching and learning occurring here are forming global leaders who will influence the major technology, social, and policy breakthroughs that are related to the critical challenges of our times. But the what's alone are not sufficient. As important and potentially more powerful than what we do in life is how we do it. All the innovation, research, and entrepreneurship emanating from Georgia Tech will be for naught if we are not leaders in improving the human condition, making a difference on a personal level, touching people's hearts in a positive way. These are the things that propel any enterprise forward and create sustaining value. Culture, not rules and procedures, drives behavior. A common culture is the key to success. It sets an institutional guidepost, a common set of principles, a common set of expected behaviors that define how we should interact with each other. At Georgia Tech, our culture is predicated on the belief that technological change is fundamental to the advancement of society. That change is inevitable. And so how will we engage? Well, you can't keep the waves off the beach. Try as you might, those waves will come crashing to the shore. And sure, some people will choose to ignore them or spend all of their resources trying to fight them off and make them stop. But as Yellow Jackets, we promise not only 
Will we prepare for and respond to the inevitable change that we will face in the future? But more than that, we pledge to ourselves and to each other and to the world that we will be leaders who will influence the future and ensure that those advances will improve the quality of life for all. It is imperative that our communities must be better off because we're here. And that is why we're so excited to have you here. As we've already mentioned, who better to understand and carry on this mission than the guy that wrote the book, How to Think, Act, and Lead in a Transformed World. Through your leadership, the Georgia Tech community, the students, staff, faculty, and alumni will continue to personify our motto of progress and service. And so on behalf of all the Georgia Tech alumni around the world, welcome back to Atlanta. Welcome back to Georgia Tech. And just remember, you're a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech and a hell of an engineer. Thank you, Tom, and each and every one of you. We appreciate you being here and for your kind words. All of our speakers, I think, have done an outstanding job of explaining what makes Georgia Tech a truly special institution, about what sets us apart from other universities, and about what brings us together and connects us to one another and to this place. President Cabrera, you have been here for almost two months now, uh, but we would like for you and the entire audience to take a look at a brief video presentation. It will give you a glimpse into what life at Tech looks like in the 21st century and what you have to look forward to as you begin this journey with us. If you want to change the world, you're at Georgia Tech. You can do that. learn to embrace failure. You just got to learn to brush it off and bounce back. And an ounce of that amounts to a comeback. It is in places like this, like Georgia Tech, with extraordinary talent and a strong mission of public service that we will find our best path forward. Progress and service, that's what it's all about. As you can tell, uh, the campus is a little bit excited, maybe even a more than a little bit excited, uh, to welcome our new president, uh, but we're not the only ones. We are pleased to be joined today by the Honorable Jeff Duncan, Lieutenant Governor uh, of the state of Georgia. <laughs> Margaret Venable, an alumna and president of Dalton State College. and Gregory Unruh, an author and professor at George Mason University. 
Please join me again in welcoming our guests. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here today. Um, it is such an honor to be surrounded by so many people that I have looked up to for uh, a, a large portion of my life, uh, those that I consider to be subject matter experts, but also those that I consider to be mentors to me as I move through my life. Um, so I add this to the long list of things that I never would have expected to happen to me when I was on campus here at Georgia Tech. Um, Oftentimes when I come back to the campus, I make my team drive me around the campus just to remind myself that some of the buildings that were here are still here. That tries to help me feel young. So, of course, as, as always, we took a trip by Woodruff today, and then that's still here in and, and the 8th Street Apartments. Uh, and so uh, it is, I still feel young. When they start tearing those buildings down, I don't really know what's going to happen to me. Um, one of those big events that happened along the way was actually the first time I got to meet Dr. Cabrera. Uh, I got to deliver... Uh, as just one of the, an incredible opportunity for myself was the commencement address this past spring uh, for the graduation ceremony. And in the back room, I got to meet Dr. Cabrera, and he probably had no idea who I was. In fact, I'm certain he didn't. And I didn't really understand his background and, and whatnot. But for some reason throughout my life, I have been just attracted to people that have two things, great perspective um, and just a, a booming personality. And I think everybody here who has met Dr. Cabrera understands that those are two skills that he brings. And, and to me, they are even more important than all the long list of achievements that his life and his story will, will deliver to us on paper. But it is, it is that ability to have a perspective that everybody that sits and meets with him, that talks to him, feels like you're, you're on the same journey he is. And his ability to communicate through a personality is what's going to allow him to be a success with the students, with the faculty, with the alumni, and with this community all across the great state of Georgia. I was told that, that this was a, a welcoming address, and everybody here understands that this is a welcome back address for Dr. Cabrera. He is woven into the very fabric of who we are. His family is woven in to the very fabric of who we are here at Georgia Tech. This institution, and now I get to look at this from a different perspective as the lieutenant governor, um, or an alternative uh, perspective, is this is what embodies to me the perfect intersection of a couple of different areas of the world that come together. This proves to be a partnership between academia, between the private sector, between the community. It seems to be the perfect intersection, and it is an opportunity for us here at Georgia Tech to put our stamp and our message all across the entire globe. And so as we look forward to this opportunity that Dr. Cabrera is going to continue to have to lead us in that charge, not just here, but around the world, I see it as a tremendous opportunity. My biggest initiative, probably I'll, I'll say as Lieutenant Governor, but I'll say in my life, is that I've really wanted to take the claim here and to push forward with Georgia being the technology capital of the East Coast of this country. Right? And it's not something I just want to create a marketing flyer for. I truly want us to achieve and earn the title of being the technology capital of the East Coast. If that happens, if we truly achieve that, it will happen because Georgia Tech continues to thrive, continues to lead, continues to invite the best and brightest from around the world to be a part of this journey, to build the confidence of investors and innovators in every square inch of this world to call Georgia Tech home and to trust us. And so I look forward to partnering with this institution. I look forward to partnering with Dr. Cabrera and his leadership as we move forward. Georgia Tech has become the center of gravity for technology in the world, and I can think of no better person to lead the charge than Dr. Cabrera. Thank you so much. And now it's my honor to bring greetings on behalf of the University System of Georgia Presidents today. Very few of us here today know what the job of the, the College of University President really involves, and even fewer know what leading the Georgia Institute of Technology entails. I'm here, President Cabrera, <clears throat> to ensure that you know that you have the full support and the confidence of your colleagues across the university system. I'm also here as an alumna of this institution and, to a lesser extent, as the proud mother of a current Georgia Tech student who will graduate this May, heavens permitting. 
<clears throat> Within the university system of Georgia, each institution carries an important and unique mission. That is certainly true of Georgia Tech. This institution enjoys an excellent reputation for producing graduates who are not merely intelligent, but who are filled with perseverance, or grit, as we like to call it these days. Students who are prepared to be the entrepreneurs and leaders of this state for years to come. I stand here today as an example of how even a chemistry major, or President Cabrera, a psychology major, from the right institution can become a college or university president. Keeping in mind that Dalton State's football team is still undefeated, <clears throat> for those students who are unable to attend Dalton State, Georgia Tech makes a fine backup school. <laughs> but seriously, University System of Georgia colleges such as Dalton State enjoy partnering with Georgia Tech through the region's engineering pathway program, for example. How lucky is it that students can begin their education in Northwest Georgia at Dalton State and then continue seamlessly to complete an engineering degree or a graduate degree at an institution as highly respected as Georgia Tech? What an amazing opportunity for our students. The leadership of the Institute, therefore, is no light matter to me or many others across this system and this state. The Chancellor and the members of the Board of Regents have reviewed the applicants carefully and they have chosen Angel Cabrera as the 12th President of Georgia Tech because they see in him the capacity to build upon a long history of excellence. President Cabrera, we appreciate your leadership and we wish you the very best because your success benefits us all. Welcome home. Good morning. morning. It's a pleasure to be here to celebrate the investiture of uh, President Cabrera, and I'm going to share a little bit of my perspective. Um, we've all heard the, the saying or thought it might be great to be a fly on the wall for some big event, and I'm sort of the fly on the wall who's watched this evolution of President Cabrera's uh, career. And just between you and me, when I first met Angel, I didn't immediately imagine him becoming the president of his alma mater, one of the leading technical universities in the country. I met Angel out of my first job at IE Business School in Madrid. Uh, we were both freshly minted PhDs and were trying to establish ourselves academically. And when I got to e, uh, IE, I made it a point to go around and meet all of the chairs of the departments and Angel was the, the chair of the human resources department. And I don't know what your typical idea you have in your mind when you think of a college professor is, but I bet the man that I saw in that office that day would fit the bill perfectly. He had a sweater vest on, horn rim glasses, the tweed jacket with the, you know, the patches on the shoulders. And it just couldn't have dawned on me at that moment that I was staring at a future university president. But it wasn't long after that initial meeting that uh, IE Business School began an internal search uh, to replace our outgoing dean. And I remember having conversations with Angel about it. I would say, everyone seems to know who this new dean's going to be except me. And, I, you know, I, and again, it, there was this, something just didn't click. He seemed like a you know, young 30-year-old something kid to me, and I couldn't imagine him being tapped to run uh, one of Europe's leading business schools. And when someone finally told me it was going to be Angel, I rushed home to my wife and said, you're never going to believe who the, who the next dean of IE Business School is going to be. And with that decision, Angel became the youngest business school dean in Europe. And that was the beginning of the career that brought us here today. But I'm going to share a secret with you that most of you don't know. And that by accepting that business school deanship, Angel forwent what was destined to be a brilliant academic career. In the brief period before becoming an administrator, he published a handful of articles, some of them with his very talented alumna wife, uh, Elizabeth, the citation, of course, is Cabrera and Cabrera, right? You're getting Cabrera squared here. Um, and those articles have uh, gone on to become classics in the knowledge management literature, each of them with thousands of citations. And another secret that you probably don't know is that Angel is a phenomenal teacher. He, uh, before he became the dean, he repeatedly won the Teaching Excellence Award 
at the university. And he would have continued to win it, except he pulled himself out of the running after he became the dean. So if you're like me, now you're wondering, why would someone give up the possibility of being an academic rock star to take on the headaches that come along with running a university? And there are many theories about that. Um, but for me, the reason is, is quite simple. For Angel, higher education isn't a job. It really is a calling. In conversations, sometimes after a glass of wine, he can wax lyrically about how important higher education is uh, in society. And it's not just talk. Uh, he has become a recognized leader in aligning higher education with society's highest values. And that began with his first deanship, uh, when Angel's potential at that point was recognized by the World Economic Forum, who tapped him as a young global leader. And he worked within that Davos network to advance many issues of ethics and civic responsibility in business schools. One of the most standout accomplishments was the creation of the United Nations Principles of Responsible Management Education, which has committed over 2,000 signatory business schools to teaching MBAs how to incorporate social and environmental responsibility into their work. And as he moved from business schools to the presidency of Virginia's largest public university, uh, this same thinking came along with him, and it continues to this day. Um, just earlier this month, we watched the latest initiative la uh, led by Angel uh, take wing. We were in uh, New York, and I was uh, honored to join President Cabrera and other, dozens of other university leaders from around the world in launching the University Global Compact, which commits colleges to support education and research in the pursuit of the world's sustainable development goals. So I'm coming from George Mason University, and so this is obviously standing here with mixed emotions. Um, we have lost a transformational leader, um, but our loss is obviously your gain, and so I want to congratulate all of you and also congratulate President Cabrera. The Honorable John Lewis, U.S. Representative for Georgia's 5th Congressional District, was scheduled to join us this morning. He sends his sincere regrets, there are things happening in D.C., uh, and asks <laughs> that we share the following. <clears throat> so it is my honor to share with you his remarks. Good morning, Lieutenant Governor Duncan, Chancellor Wrigley, members of the Board of Regents, faculty, staff, students, friends, and everyone in the Georgia Tech community. I am very sorry that I'm unable to join you today for the investiture of Dr. Angel Cambrera as the 12th president of the Georgia Institute of Technology. As you know, Georgia Tech selected a president with long, deep ties to the university, a graduate who was also the husband and the father of Yellow Jackets. On behalf of the people of Georgia's 5th Congressional District, I would like to welcome you, Dr. Cabrera, and your family back home. Founded in 1885, Georgia Tech's mission originally focused on helping our great state adjust, compete, and succeed in a rapidly industrializing economy. Today, the brightest men and women of every race, creed, and background are drawn to Georgia Tech from every corner of the world. For the past 134 years, Georgia Tech has striven to develop the minds of young people who are now great inventors and innovators. These amazing visionaries now help to make Atlanta the bustling international city in which we are so proud to study, work, and live. In Metro Atlanta, this world-renowned university has a reputation for being an outstanding research hub, a good neighbor, and a thoughtful partner. With the local community and many educational institutions in our great city, state, and region. Incoming students are infused with the special spirit of this stellar institution and welcome the challenge that Yellow Jackets are expected and empowered to change the world. Each student and faculty member is committed to doing the hard work and the hard math to make life better and fairer for all of us and for generations yet unborn. Dr. Cabrera, you now have the great privilege and responsibility of leading one of our nation's finest institutions of higher education. It is my hope that you will continue and strengthen Georgia Tech's outstanding legacy and ensure that the Institute remains an innovative force in Metro Atlanta and a renowned global center for talent, teaching, and technology. Under your leadership, I have no doubt that Georgia Tech will continue to encourage the students, inspire the faculty, unlock potential, and transform the lives of everyone who proudly calls Georgia home. I hope that you will lead and care for this institute with an eye to the future and a commitment to justice. Again, I thank and congratulate you on this momentous occasion.
And now for the moment where it all happens. <laughs> for the introduction and investiture of Georgia Tech's 12th president, please welcome Steve Wrigley, Chancellor for the University System of Georgia. Good morning, everyone. This is a special day for me in many ways, and I've really enjoyed getting to know Dr. Cabrera these last several months. So it's exciting for all of us, a big day for Georgia Tech, and I look forward to working with him for many, many years. We appreciate Lieutenant Governor Duncan spending a few minutes with us. There are several members of the Board of Regents here, uh, and I appreciate their being here today. I know there's a few legislators I've seen, so thank you for being here and, and your support of the university system and, and of Georgia Tech. It's a big contingent of USG presidents. You heard from one of them, Dr. Uh, Margaret Venable, and we appreciate them taking time to be here to show support for their new colleague. We are here today to share in the time-honored tradition to invest a new president of the Georgia Institute of Technology. First, let me say, being president is a team effort, and the most important part of every president's team is family. I want to recognize Dr. Beth Cabrera, who, like her husband, is a highly accomplished graduate of Georgia Tech. Also, their son, Alex, a Tech alumnus who is currently in the PhD program at Carnegie Mellon, and daughter, Amelia, who in this family of high achievers is studying at Harvard. Thank you all for being here and your support of Georgia Tech and Dr. Cabrera. Thank you very much. Those of you here today play an essential role as well in the life of Georgia Tech as faculty, staff, students, and alumni and friends. Thank you for being here and thank you for what you do for Georgia Tech. We human beings created ceremonies to commemorate important transitions in life, to set them apart, to remind ourselves to pause and recognize that something vital to our future is occurring. Thus, we have weddings and funerals, christenings and bar mitzvahs, birthdays and commencements. And yes, we have this investiture because it marks a very important day. The dictionary says an investiture is a, quote, formal ceremony of conferring the authority and symbols of high office. And since the Middle Ages, with this ceremony, presidents accept the responsibility of leading the pursuit of knowledge in a college or university. It is an awesome responsibility. Yet leading a public university today is also a complex responsibility. It is a shared responsibility for the benefit of students, the community, this state, under the governing authority of the Board of Regents. We rely on the governor and general assembly for essential funding and guidance, and we must also have the support and donations of alumni and friends, and we are grateful for that support. This day is important because public higher education plays a critical role in our society. That role is educating students and advancing knowledge. In doing so, Georgia Tech contributes to the prosperity and intellectual life of this state. It is a high calling to prepare students for a life of progress and service. It is also a high calling to advance knowledge to transform how we live. Georgia Tech, among the top universities in the world, answers that calling every day through the outstanding teaching, research, and public service of its excellent faculty. As chancellor, I believe in this institution and its mission, and I appreciate the dedication of those in the campus community who are so deeply committed to the success of its students. Ultimately, the purpose of the university system is knowledge, to create it through research, transfer it through teaching, and apply it through service. So it is the primary role of the president to create and to sustain an environment where the pursuit of knowledge can thrive. 
It is not always easy. Being a public university president today is sometimes challenging, frequently frustrating, but it is always rewarding. The reward comes in igniting intellectual curiosity even in a single student, because in doing so, you can alter the course of a life. And that makes the job of president, however challenging, ultimately rewarding. Dr. Cabrera, as you know, arrived as president already a yellow jacket. He knows the Georgia Tech community, and he knows what makes this place buzz. I am excited about Dr. Cabrera's leadership because he will challenge this great university to dream even bigger and to reach ever higher. That is ultimately what a great leader does, and I am confident Dr. Cabrera is just such a leader. It is now my responsibility to formally invest Dr. Angel Cabrera with the duties and responsibilities of, Georgia, of the president of the Georgia Institute of Technology. President Cabrera, please join me at the podium. I charge you, Dr. Angel Cabrera, as president of the Georgia Institute of Technology, to seek academic excellence and to advance the pursuit of knowledge. I charge you always to place foremost in your thoughts and actions the needs of students, faculty, and staff. Finally, I charge you to protect the interests of Georgia Tech and its community, the Board of Regents, and the state of Georgia. President Cabrera, do you accept these charges? I do. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Regents of the University System of Georgia, I invest you, Dr. Ankel Cabrera, as the 12th President of the Georgia Institute of Technology. Congratulations. Fantastic. So I was speaking before of moments, we have another wonderful moment in front of us. The National Panel Leading Council has a long-standing significance in the lives of black students on college campuses. On November 20th, 1976, Omega Psi Phi became the first MPHC fraternity chartered at Georgia Tech. Today, Tech's MPHC community is comprised of dynamic students who are consistently striving for greatness, unity, and awareness of issues that affect their community. They're also known for the art of stepping and strolling. The history of stepping has no official origin, but can be traced back hundreds of years in African history and culture. It has evolved today into an art form that enjoys significance within the MPHC community, paying homage to the past while embracing the change of the present and the promise of the future. Please join me now in welcoming members from Georgia Tech's National Pan-Hellenic Council.
Just give me the cards. Hi. I, I had always wanted to do that. Uh, you know, as of, as of being back at uh, Georgia Tech as president weren't surreal enough, I got to write the rambling wreck on stage. That's uh, crazy. Uh, that's, I think, what, it mean, what we mean when we say, uh, uh, we're Georgia Tech, we can do that. Right? That's, uh, that's what I mean. I am, I am so absolutely honored uh, to have so many of you join us today, uh, and so grateful to share the moment with people who mean so much to me. People have traveled from far away, uh, from as far as South Korea, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Spain. Kamsabnida. Gracias de corazón a todos. I will never forget this moment. I am uh, incredibly grateful to all the members of the Georgia Tech community for being here today, our faculty, students, our staff, alumni, I really get to work with absolutely amazing people. Now, I also understand that our friend George P. Burdell is here in the audience as well, <laughs> and that apparently he has never missed a Georgia Tech investiture. Uh, George, you don't, you don't need to uh, stand up, but thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, for our guests, if you have never heard of the famous George, just ask any student later, and they'll tell you all about his incredible achievements. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the uh, proceedings today just as much as I have. I feel like uh, the master of ceremonies, uh, Dean Isbell, may have found a new, a new calling. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and I, I want to thank him and, and all the speakers for sharing their words of wisdom. Really, uh, what you did and what you shared today means, means the world to me. Uh, thank you so much. Um, a warm welcome to the delegates of our sister schools throughout Georgia, throughout the nation, and from around the world. I love this display. I hope you've captured it, because uh, what this represents, we may be very different and serve different um, constituencies, but we're all in this together. We share one mission. Thank you all so very much for what you do for uh, higher education. And um, as the chancellor just did, I want to thank all the government officials, community leaders, and philanthropists, many of them here today, for believing in higher ed and for investing in higher ed. We simply could not do what we do without your support. And I want to thank all my friends and family for always, always being there. I am moved to have so many of them here and, uh, and so many others watching from far away. A toda mi familia que nos sigue de lejos. Un abrazo muy fuerte desde Atlanta y un millón de gracias por todo lo que siempre habéis hecho por mí. Uh, most special recognition uh, to Beth, my wife of 25 years. Uh, Beth was the smartest, most fun, and most beautiful person in my class at Georgia Tech. She still is. Uh, she has been an absolutely wonderful companion in a life journey that neither of us could have ever anticipated. She's the best mother in the world and has had an impressive career despite of the demands of my own. She has been a, a true partner in every step along the way. Thank you, Beth, I, I love you. Uh, despite not knowing Spanish uh, when we met, Beth went on to earn tenure at a business, as a business professor at a leading Spanish university. That university, Carlos III of Madrid, is represented here today by the very person who hired her and mentored her, our dear friend, Professor Isabel Gutierrez, and by a dear childhood friend of mine, Professor Juanjo Vaquero, who's today their vice president of research. Carlos III is one of the most admired universities in Spain and an awesome study abroad destination for all Georgia Tech students. <laughs> Please stand up so we can recognize you. Where are you? Thank you. <laughs> and uh, of course, since you've heard uh, so much about my children, it is uh, my privilege to prove to you that they do exist. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Alex and uh, Emily, uh, really, and by the way, thank you, Dean Isbell. You prepared this young man incredibly well. He's now an, uh, an NSF graduate fellow 
as you heard, a uh, first year PhD student at Carnegie Mellon. And he was a big reason why his sister still is a major in computer science at Harvard. So, estoy muy orgulloso de vosotros dos. Os quiero muchísimo. Y, and they're skipping class to be here, so uh, just saying. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the just uh, this is, uh, we have been a little bit triggered in the last two months by lots of memories. Uh, probably the, the toughest test I took during my time as a student at Georgia Tech uh, was the day I traveled to Florence, Alabama, the home of Beth, uh, to ask uh, Keith and Marilyn uh, for their blessings to marry their daughter and <clears throat> uh, uh, move to Spain with her. Uh, <laughs> Instead of running me out of town, which may have crossed their mind, actually, uh, they and their other daughter, Catherine, uh, opened their arms to me and have treated me as a member of the family ever since. And for that, I thank you so very much. And I do want to thank the people who actually brought me here, and that is the members of the search committee. They spent a lot of time. Uh, looking at amazing uh, people, and they were chaired by uh, a Georgia Tech alum, the chairman of and, and regent, Ben Tarpan. So thank you uh, uh, for uh, Regent Tarpan for, for leading the charge. And then, of course, to Chancellor Steve Wrigley and the chairman of the Board of Regents, Don Waters, uh, and everybody else on that board for actually casting their vote in my favor. Uh, thank you so very much. <laughs> Now, I, I feel a great sense of responsibility to uh, follow in the footsteps of 11 uh, prior presidents who uh, very skillfully steered us through different times and circumstances. Uh, two of them, uh, Wayne Clough and uh, Bud Peterson, are with us today. Together, they have led us through an amazing, remarkable 24 years of growth in size and stature and influence. I personally look up to them as examples of leadership. I value them as friends, and I would like to recognize them both and thank them for their continuing service to this institution. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, um, as a Georgia Tech grad, I'm a math wizard, uh, so I have done the numbers and I have calculated that the average Georgia Tech president has had a tenure of exactly 11 years and three months. <laughs> the shortest serving president, your bottom left on that photo, uh, was Art Hansen, who left Art after only two years to move to his alma mater, Purdue. It is my hope that Hansen will retain that record for years to come. <laughs> And since, since I'm already at my alma mater, may you keep the record forever, sir. <laughs> the, longest, the longest tenure uh, was Marion Britton, and he served for 22 years. Britton as in Britain's dining hall. And I am really not interested in breaking that record either. <laughs> so my goal today, uh, Chairman Waters, Chancellor Wrigley, I'm shooting for a productive, successful presidency, presidency of average duration. That's, that's what I'm, that is what I'm aiming for. Now, more seriously, uh, Beth and I have had a lot of fun reconnecting and rediscovering Atlanta in the last two, two months. We absolutely love what has happened in this city since we left. Uh, Tech Square, the Bet Line, the creative scene, the film, the music. We now even have a world-class soccer team at last. <laughs> Vamos, Atlanta United. <laughs> and, and by the way, we love the fact that Georgia Tech has been behind a lot of what has happened here. It's just absolutely remarkable. Now, one of the visits that we found especially impactful and moving was the National Center for Civil and Human Rights downtown. And those of you who are visiting, add that to the list of places to see. It was a very powerful experience, but it made us reflect on the impact that this city, that Atlanta has, hired, has had on the entire nation and beyond 
during the civil rights movement. And it also inspired us to think how much more Atlanta can do. Now, right after we arrived here, uh, Congressman John Lewis was very kind to invite me to his office to offer a warm welcome to Atlanta. And we immediately talked about the civil rights movement and he shared with me some photos. And I was moved by the cover of Life magazine of that momentous day in 1965 when at the age of only 25, can you believe it, he led hundreds of people across that bridge in Selma to fight injustice, to stand up for the rights of everybody. And he, and not only the leaders that we remember, like Dr. Martin Luther King, but thousands of others whose names we don't remember, put their lives on the line to demand, to demand justice for the oppressed. Their courage helped transform an entire nation for the better and sent a message of hope around the world that still resonates today. The epicenter of that movement of hope and social, science, uh, social change was right here in Atlanta. He grew out of churches around Auburn Avenue, in classrooms in the Atlanta University Center, and the hearts of people who were committed to a better future. I feel strongly that it's now our turn to take up the mantle. There are still many bridges that need to be crossed to make our society more just and prosperous, to bring about freedom, opportunity, and peace to people around the world, to help us all live healthier, safer, more enlightened lives. And much of that work can once again start right here in Atlanta, this time in the classrooms, the labs, the innovation spaces of the Georgia Institute of Technology. We have, we have what it takes. We live in one of the largest, most vibrant, most diverse, best globally connected cities in the nation. We have a state-of-the-art campus in the heart of a neighborhood that we have helped transform in a hub of innovation and entrepreneurship. We enjoy a world-class faculty across a whole array of academic disciplines and an absolutely amazing staff. We offer outstanding programs in business, liberal arts, sciences, computing, the design, in addition to engineering that are considered among the world's finest. We attract thousands of the most talented students from Georgia, from across the country and around the world, and many more thousands that we serve online. And with over a billion dollars in research awards across all the colleges and GTRI, we are among the nation's most research-intensive universities. Few institutions in the world enjoy the abundance of talent and technological resources that we have right here at Georgia Tech. And with those resources come, of course, the responsibility and opportunity to try and make a difference in the world. That is what our motto, progress and service, is all about. Every day since I've arrived, I've been inspired by the projects that I'm learning about and I'm discovering. Take uh, Professor Shannon Yee, who I met. He's a mechanical engineer, uh, mechanical engineer professor. He's an expert in uh, thermal conductivity of polymers. Little that he knew, he ended up partnering with none other than Bill Gates to design a new toilet that processes its own waste and that can help save the lives of millions of children who are growing up in cities and slums around the world without proper sewer. Or Take recently in one of the football games, I, I ran into General Stephen Melton and he approached me to let me know how technology that was developed at GTRI had saved his life and the lives of many other American soldiers flying missions on the C-130 since the mid-90s. And I met executive director of the Peanut Commission of Georgia who explained that Georgia Tech research is helping increase the yield of one of the crops that of course is at the heart of the Georgia economy. Or take my new favorite spot on campus, the Candida Building. We're supposed to love our buildings equally? I don't, I, that's, my, that's, <laughs> that's my favorite. This is uh, an amazing, striking example of beautiful, sustainable design, integration with nature, human inclusion, and well-being. And this building will inspire architects, civil engineers, business, and policy leaders for generations to come. These projects and hundreds of projects that happen in this institution every day 
show that technology can drive change for the better, but it has to be grounded on a deep understanding of technology's human, social, and economic context. It has to be connected with ideas from different disciplines, and it has to incorporate perspectives from different stakeholders. And that should inform how we think about our curriculum and how we think about the research that we conduct here. Now, one thing I learned when, uh, when we were students in psychology at Georgia Tech is the fact that learning happens when we confront evidence or when we engage in conversation with ideas that are different from our own. Our minds, however, are hardwired to prove ourselves right, to confirm the ideas that we already have. That's why we like to hang out with people who are like us. That's why we like to always watch the same news channel and read the same newspaper. And if you wonder why our society is becoming that polarized, that's exactly why. However, learning and innovation happens when we do just the opposite. When we consider that our beliefs may be wrong or incomplete. When we engage in conversation with different people who may hold different ideas and when we confront evidence that challenges our beliefs. Just like biological evolution requires genetic diversity, so does learning, innovation, creativity. They depend on diversity of ideas. So increasing diversity at Georgia Tech is not just a moral imperative. It is a necessary condition for us to be the best learning and research place that we can be. We, we have made a lot of progress as an institution, but there is a lot more that needs to be done. It wasn't until 1952 that Georgia Tech accepted the first white women as full-time students, 1952. And it wasn't until 1961 when the first African-American students were allowed to enroll in this institution. During my first week on the job, I had the privilege of meeting the first black students in Tech's history, Fort Green. Ralph Long, Jr., and Lawrence Williams, as well as Tech's first African-American graduate, Ronald Yancey. I am delighted the two of them, Ralph Long and Lawrence Williams, are with us today. Thank you, sir, for being here. Thank you. While these gentlemen were on campus, they had a panel and shared some of the stories about what it was like to be the lone black student on Georgia Tech campus in 1961. Some of that was hard to process. It was hard. And yet it was deeply inspiring. It showed us that while progress may in no way be inevitable, it is possible when there are people with the courage to make things change. So today, we're the number one producer of women engineers in the country. We're the number one producer of minority engineers and the largest producer of African-American engineering PhDs in the country. These are wonderful statistics. We're very proud of them. However, there's still only 6% of our total enrollment at Georgia Tech is African-American. Women still are underrepresented in engineering disciplines and computing. And the percentage of low-income students who are able to attend Georgia Tech still trails the statistics in some of the leading universities in the country. We can do better, and we must do better. Um, now, as we increase the numbers, we have to work equally hard to make sure that this is an inclusive campus where everybody can feel a sense of belonging, where everybody can thrive no matter where they come from. If you have talent, if you want to work hard, if you share our commitment to progress and service, we want you here no matter where you come from. The world today is healthier, safer, better fed, less poor, more educator, more educated, and freer than it has ever been in no small part because of new technologies and because the institutions that new technology has enabled. 
Much of that progress has emanated from places like Georgia Tech. There will soon be about 8 billion of us on this planet, and we must figure out how to improve everybody's quality of life, how to provide clean, sustainable food, water, and energy, healthcare, education for all, build more just and peaceful societies, and protect the natural environment our, uh, on which our lives depend. What makes me very excited about being back at Georgia Tech is to be part of a community that can make a real difference in the most important problems of our time. Now, I have spent, as you would imagine, uh, the, a good part of the last few weeks getting to know some of our most generous donors, to tell them how thankful I am for what they've done and how excited I am to work with them in the future. And when I have had those meetings, I've asked them all the question, why do you give money to Georgia Tech? Now, the stories are different, but their message is always the same. They believe that this is how they can have the biggest impact in the lives of others. We all get that because we all know we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the opportunities each of us had to go to school. I am fully aware that the likelihood that a kid like me, raised in the 70s, by parents without a college degree, in a working class neighborhood outside of Madrid, that the odds that a kid like that would one day be named president of a leading American research university is virtually nil. It can only be explained by three words, public higher education. Thanks to the education I received at Universidad Politecnica de Madrid, I learned about research, about technology, and about a program called the Fulbright Scholarship, which would allow someone like me to come to the US and be at one of those great research universities. And it was thanks to the faculty I had here that I was inspired to pursue a career in higher education. When I first arrived to uh, Georgia Tech 28 years ago, I was immediately struck by the incredible resources at a place like Georgia Tech. And it wasn't even anything near what we have today. And I was also shocked and inspired that a place like this would open its doors to someone like me. I first, my conclusion was, that, well, this is a reflection of America's wealth. America has these types of universities because it can afford them, because it's, it's wealthy enough to be able to build these universities. I soon realized I had it all backwards. America is prosperous. America is innovative and one of the most competitive nations in the world. American society is dynamic and open because it built great universities that opened their doors to talent of all backgrounds. And that is, in a nutshell, what brings us all together, a belief in the transformative power of a great research university. We stand at the forefront of those efforts Georgia Tech is not only a strategic asset for Atlanta and Georgia and an invaluable national resource, but it is one of the world's essentials, essential hubs of innovation with the potential to create solutions for the many pressing challenges of our time. Let's design and build a better future. Let's work on our mission of progress and service together. Thank you.